Thanks, everybody, and good evening. My name is Wink. I'd prefer to be Alex Trebek, but that didn't work out. In fact, my spies tell me that, truth be known, Alex was Jeremy Boring's first choice till he found out that Alex get, gets paid by the word and I just show up for a free glass of wine. So here I am. My Saturday and Sunday couldn't have been more diverse. Last night, I was hosting the annual gala for the Pregnancy Counseling Institute at the Reagan Library. And today I had the honor of introducing our five panelists that you'll be seeing, two events that couldn't possibly be more different unless I discover that one or more of our panelists are pregnant, which I doubt will happen. Please allow me to introduce each of our panelists. Jeremy Boring is a writer, a filmmaker, and co-founder and COO of The Daily Wire. He's executive director of the number one conservative podcast, The Ben Shapiro Show, as well as The Andrew Clavin Show and The Michael Knowles Show. Jeremy's host of Daily Wire Backstage, a show about politics, philosophy, cigars, and general pretentiousness. His filmography includes the psychological thriller Spiral and the modern Western The Arroyo. Jeremy served five years as the executive director of the Friends of Aid, a private organization for conservatives working in the entertainment industry. That's where I first had the pleasure of meeting Jeremy. Let's hear a nice shout out for Jeremy Boring, everybody. Thank you, Wink. Here he is, right here on our stage. Next, we welcome to the panel, Elisha Kraus, a conservative commentator and writer. Yeah, give her a nice round of applause. She's the best looking one on the panel, I can assure you that. She's a conservative commentator and writer based in LA. Alicia currently works as a contributor and on-air host at the Daily Wire. She worked, all right, enough of that. She looks better than Vanna, doesn't she? Huh? She I've works as a contributor that. for On Air Host and The Daily Wire alongside Ben Shapiro, Michael Knowles, and Andrew Clavin. Previously, Alicia, in red, was the director of outreach at PragerU, a morning drive talk radio host, a contributor and director of Grassroots at Truth Revolt, and a campaign manager and producer of the Sean Hannity radio show. Obviously, Alicia has too much time on her hands. We have to find something more for her to do. She needs a job. Ladies and gentlemen, again, for Alicia Kraus. <laughs> Andrew Clavin is the author of such internationally best-selling crime novels as True Crime, filmed by Clint Eastwood, Don't Say a Word, a film starring Michael Douglas, an Empire of Lies, Stephen King called Andrew the most original novelist of crime and suspense since Cornell Woolrich. He's been nominated for the Mystery Writers of America's Edgar Award five times, and he's won twice. Andrew's most recent book is a memoir of his religious journey, The Great Good Things, A Secular Jew Comes to Faith in Christ. His most recent work, a fiction anyway, is the serial fantasy thriller podcast, Another Kingdom. It's available on iTunes and other podcast ventures. Andrew's essays and op-eds on politics, religion, movies, and literature have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, and elsewhere. He currently does a Monday through Thursday podcast, The Andrew Clavin Show for The Daily Wire. Time limits preclude me from continuing with Andrew's countless credits, so let me simply say, welcome, Andrew Clavin. Thank you very much. Hey, Andrew, welcome. It's difficult to know where to begin and end when introducing Ben Shapiro. We all know he's editor-in-chief of dailywire.com, host of the Ben Shapiro Show, the top conservative podcast in the nation and syndicated radio show in the top 10 markets. He's authored seven, count them, seven books, including the New York Times bestseller, Bullies, How the Left's Culture of Fear and Intimidation Silences America. His enormous success didn't just begin yesterday. He's been a nationally syndicated columnist since he was 17 years of age. 
a graduate of UCLA and Harvard Law School. His conservative peers say this, Rush Limbaugh, quote, Ben's not content to have people be dazzled by his brilliance. He goes out and confronts and tries to persuade, mobilize, and motivate people, unquote. Here's what Glenn Beck says, I've never known him to back down from a fight. Personally, I've watched every episode of his recent weekend election series on Fox News Channel, and I, very frankly, was totally mesmerized. The ratings, by the way, were through the roof. I'd be shocked if Ben doesn't have his own daily show on Fox soon. God only knows how he'd work it into his busy schedule, but we want to see him on a daily basis, don't we? Yeah. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, Ben Shapiro. Hey, everybody, give a big round of applause for our pal, Wink Martindale. Well, thank you for uh, coming and seeing us today. My name's Jeremy Boring. I'm the God King of... Shame! <laughs> Shame! That's what... It's Michael Knowles, everybody. <laughs> I thought we were supposed to dress sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, cosplay is only at Comic-Con. <laughs> oh, I got it all wrong. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you of me or of Ben? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely of Alicia. <laughs> Please no. <laughs> so here's how we're going to conduct our panel for today. It's going to be all Q&A all the time. Uh, in fine Ben Shapiro tradition, if you disagree generally with the things that we say, we would love to hear questions from you first. If you agree, you're really who we want to hear from, but we have to say this whole other thing. It's a business deal. Uh, so I think the microphone's going to be uh, down here if people want to come up and ask us questions. We, I don't guarantee answers to questions. Uh, we have been known to go on long tangents for our own amusement. It may surprise you to hear. How dare you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Who's first? A uh, quick question, maybe. Um, curious, understanding that the media and our educational system are under liberal control, how, how do you guys think we're still what appears to be mostly a conservative nation? Because our kids have been taught a certain way for generations. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of weird yeah. that there's still so many of us conservatives when... You definitely, yeah, I'm curious you definitely you agree with us. Uh, <laughs> ben, why don't you take the first one? I mean, I'm more of a pessimist, so I'm not sure that we're still mostly a conservative nation, to be honest with you. Maybe that's just from living in L.A. But mm. I, I'm concerned that a lot of the main central tenets of conservatism have been lost over time, which is why what you know, we're all in the room to do or, and what we're trying to do on the stage is, I think, really important. But I think that the, the short answer is that America is the most religious country in the West by a very, very large margin. Uh, and as that religious inclination tends to reduce, so too does the conservatism inherent in that, in that religious tradition. People tend to edge into kind of normal urban leftism that you see predominant in Western Europe. Hmm. Was that sufficiently depressing for you? <laughs> uh, this is a question for uh, Mr. Claven. Um, I'm, a Jew I'm a conservative Jewish boy going to a Christian school. Do you have anything I can maybe get from the experience? Any, any advice? Anything you can get from the experience of, uh, of being in a Christian school? Yeah. Salvation? I <laughs> <laughs> Don't listen to him. <laughs> fight, 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 fight. Hi, hey, how's it going? Um, thank you for taking my question. Uh, this question is pretty much for anyone who's uh, opposed to abortion. Uh, I'm going to use the number that I always hear about uh, Planned Par uh, that, that Planned Parenthood has uh, aborted. Is it 50 or 60 million? All of them. You get my all, point. All of them. High number. So my, my question is, so I, I, I am pro-choice, and, uh, and I think I've heard Ben say that it, 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 abortion is evil, but my, my question is, one, is it a necessary evil for population control? And mm -hmm. uh, my opinion is that, is that if, you know, we're, we're already at 325 million people right now, I think, I think wages are stagnant, I think jobs are scarce because simply we are overpopulated, so... 
what is what, uh, if what statistic can you provide to show that uh, wages are stagnant or that we've run out of jobs? I mean, people are struggling. People, people are struggling, and I'm seeing every. So you should kill a whole lot of other people. I'm not tracking your logic. Uh, okay, so my 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 question is primarily, um, what it, do you guys think we would be better off with uh, an additional 60 million people mm -hmm. on, on in this country right now? Uh, versus, you know, how do we abort it? Yeah, so there's this other thing that happened in the mid-20th century where several million people were killed in Europe, and I think the world would be better off with them. What do you guys say? <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can solve an awful lot of problems by killing people. It's, it's kind of where, where you sort of draw the line. If you don't draw the line at killing people, you know, you could solve the problem of not liking your wife. You could solve the problem of <laughs> a guy, some guy has the job you want. You know, you can solve all those problems by killing people. The, the thing is, though, you know, there are seven million unfilled jobs in this country, seven million unfilled jobs. So we could actually use some population. And there are and, and wages are actually not stagnating because of the there's so many transfers that the money people have. The, the value of the money people have is so much further than it used to be. A poor person today is living at the level of a middle class person in the 80s, which is not that long ago. So we're actually doing quite well in that regard. But even if we weren't, I'm not sure that killing people is my first go-to. So Mal Malthusian, Malthusian theory, Malthusian economics, uh, has basically been disproved over the past 50 years. Paul Ehrlich was, was one of the main exponents of, of Malthusian population control theories. He wrote a book called The Population Bomb back in the 1960s, in which he predicted that within 15 years there would be mass starvation, hundreds of millions of people dying from starvation. And in the mid-'80s, he made a bet with another social scientist named Julian Simon. And he said, Julian Simon said to him, pick any five commodities, any five, and tell me that the price is going to go up, meaning that we're going to hit scarcity levels because of overpopulation. And Ehrlich picked five, and Simon says, I don't care which five you pick, the price will go down over time because human ingenuity mm -hmm. is so much more powerful than population forces. Simon won the bet, Ehrlich lost the bet, Ehrlich still teaches at Berkeley. So it doesn't seem to matter who's right and who's wrong in this particular debate. The fact is that the population now sustained on planet Earth is well over 7 billion. You know, a century ago, it was significantly less than half of that. But we are now living more prosperously across virtually every area of the world, specifically because human ingenuity is so grand and great. And killing off incipient human life, forget about the moral problem of killing human beings, killing off the creativity of 60 million additional human beings means killing our own future. And I will say, I used to be in favor of abortion when I was young and irresponsible and stupid. Before, so we, I, before we forced him into marriage and childhood. <laughs> that's right, before I was forced into living more morally. But so I, I actually do see this point, and I, I remember the point at which my mind was open, which is that one has to recognize, without going into all the moral questions, that it is a human life. And as Drew said, you can solve a lot of problems by killing people. So I'll give you the question that Diana Shaw, a bioethicist, asked me, which is... <laughs> Which is, uh, if you want to control economic problems or political problems, other than unborn babies, which group of Americans would you be willing to kill? Hmm. So, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So, uh, I, I think there's a significant difference between a life that hasn't been, ha hasn't been, uh, been born versus human lives that are already living, breathing, eating, etc. So, where's your point of viability then? Um, if you're going to make the viability argument, where's your point of viability? You recognize that it's a human. Most likely, I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to answer this. Are you a parent? I think your opinion will change when you become a parent. I think your opinion will change when you hear the most beautiful sound on the face of the planet, which is your child's heartbeat when it is in your partner's womb. Uh, so, so I think I... your opinion will change when a blood test at eight weeks shows that it is a boy or a girl. And then you can come back to me and try to make an argument to kill a human being because you are making an argument to value one life more than another. And I just don't think that's an argument that's your right to and, make. And I actually think that your point is well made. Her point or my point? Uh, no, I think your point's well made. There is a difference between a human who's been born and a human who hasn't been born. And that's that the human who has been born has some ability to fend for themselves and therefore a responsibility to defend those who can't. Thanks for your question. We're going to take some more. Hi again. So uh, earlier uh, I asked, I told Ben I kind of leaned to the left, and he certainly brought me closer to the center. But one of the reasons that I still affiliate uh, with the Democratic Party is because the environment. 
Um, and I'd really like to hear you rationalize your opinion because I'm all for free markets, but I think that in the environmental realm, uh, that's one thing that free markets cannot incentivize is a move towards sustainability. So what is your opinion overall about government involvement uh, in those sort of things, the EPA, so on and so forth? Michael, why don't you field this? Sure. I, I am a conservationist. I love the environment. I'm a conservative and conservatives conserve. I'm not an environmentalist, and I think uh, that there are different priorities here. I think the environmentalist says we need to be nice to the ducks and the tr delta smelt because they have some right and some dignity that they deserve, whatever. Uh, I certainly don't think that. I think that we need to be nice to the deer so that we can go shoot more deer. I think it's fun to shoot deer and we should be able to do more of it. Obviously, there are certain uh, externalities of our uh, economy that uh, uh, damage the environment. We need to take care of that. There are groups that do that. There are reasonable laws passed by municipalities, by states, and by the federal government. I think the left, the environmentalist left, has made an idol out of the environment. Uh, it's, no uh, it's no coincidence that the environmentalist movement really came into full swing after the fall of communism. I think they've made an idol out of it, and I think it puts the car cart before the horse. Sure, but I, like, for instance, are any of you opposed to the EPA? Like, would you abolish the EPA? I, I would like the EPA reduced to a guy with a, a, one of those pool testers, you know? <laughs> I, you could go from state to state and test the water and say, that's a little dirty, would you clean that up, please, and I'll see you in another year. You know, I'm I, fine I, with that if he has to fly coach. I mean, <laughs> one of the reasons that a lot of conservatives oppose the EPA is not just because of what the EPA does, it's because we oppose regulatory agencies as a general fact of government. Because the executive branch was not designed to be a legislative branch, and the EPA makes right. and promulgates enormous numbers of regulations that nobody understands, nobody gets, and that are then put into force by people who are unelected and can't be gotten rid of. So that makes it an, un, an unsustainable form of government, or at least a non-answerable form of government. It, look, nobody wants to see the environment destroyed. As far as the idea that market incentives don't account for a lot of environmental incentives, that's actually not true. I mean, the fact is that fuel efficiency is something that is largely driven by free market concerns. I mean, if you look at the last couple of years in the United States, uh, the, the fact is that since the signing of the Paris Accords, the United States has been the number one reducer, number one reducer in carbon emissions across the world without even implementing the Paris Accords. China signed the Paris Accords and has been the, the number one polluter. So signing a bunch of meaningless agreements doesn't actually do the job. What does do the job is not only a greater commitment by individuals to environmentalism, right. but also a, a drive toward fuel efficiency uh, that is worthwhile. I mean, n nuclear energy has been largely cast out by the left. Nuclear energy is the safest form and most renewable form, if we're going to use that term, yeah. the most renewable form of energy. So, you know, I, I think that we're all on the same page as far as trying to help the environment, but there is a balance in terms of how much of the economy are you willing to sacrifice in, in, on behalf of what level of benefit to the environment and to future human beings. And how much power would you give to the federal government? Well, oh, that, that's, that's yeah. what I'm saying, is because like you just said, you know, you there are problems that need to be taken care of, and if it's not going to be the EPA, how are we going to enforce that? On the state and local level, and also by the federal, and also by the legislature itself, actually passing laws that that yeah. are answerable by elections. There's, the problem with the EPA is that it, it literally what they will do is they will pass a law, and then they will say, "Go clean up the environment." That's the law, yeah. and then the EPA will just say, "Okay, well that means anything we want it to mean." That's not an. There's ten thousand regulations form of government yeah. that aren't answerable. It's also regulations. I mean, think, I think we all agree to we're we're fine with doing away with the Department of Education for the very same reason. Right. Because it is a national, federal, based in Washington, D.C., that is working with lobbyists and awful teachers' unions, that it's telling someone in Podunk, Texas, how to teach their children. And you have the same problem with EPA regulations, where they're trying to legislate from afar and tell a rancher in Montana what to do with his cows and his business and his runoff when they've never even been on the ground in Montana. Yeah. I also feel like the, the country on earth that's done the most to innovate, done the most to innovate in terms of fuel efficiency, renewable resources, uh, all the technology that's created modernity is this one. And when the environmental left can come up with some sort of theory for how to fix the environment that doesn't penalize the only engine that I think on this earth has the actual capacity to address any of these problems, which is American ingenuity, uh, then I'll give it a more serious listen. Sure, but would, would you all agree that there is sort of a problem in the Republican Party and that they're not very environmentally conscious? No. No. I, uh, you know, I think that the problem is, is that every story that you hear on the news is two stories. One, it's the story, and one, it's why leftism will solve the problem. Nobody wants to say, 
nobody wants to say there's no environmental problems, we don't want to protect the environment, but the answer from the left is always more government, always more power, yep. always more centralized power. You know, and the EPA at this point, you know, not only, not only do they pass laws, but when you appeal them, you have to appeal to the EPA. Mm -hmm. So they can basically, under Obama, they could basically show up at your house and declare your sink a waterway and start telling you how to shave. And I actually disagree with you guys slightly in the sense that I do think that both parties talk past the point with regard to environmentalism. I think there's a reactionary thing that's been happening on both sides where if I say that I think that the world is warming, which I do, and I think that most of that is human caused, which I do, but my solution is not massive government intervention, which I also do. The left calls me a global warming denier, and the right suggests that I'm falling for the greatest hoax in the history of mankind. Uh, and I think that it's, it's possible to have conversations at a level of policy without castigating the other side as either completely scientifically ignorant or as deeply, you know, attempting to destroy all forms of human freedom, but... It's not as much fun. Though. Yeah, that's true. No, I definitely disagree with that. Thanks for your question. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. Hey, panel. Uh, my name's Sean. Um, I wanted to ask you to speak about uh, racism in uh, Hollywood casting. And I think, it's my opinion, that real diversity isn't in who is cast as the hero or protagonist, it's who is cast as the villain, you know. Uh, take Star Wars, for instance, you have a, you know, social justice warrior, you know, it's going to be diverse, it's the most diverse cast, and, you know, the rebellion is all the colors of the rainbow, but the empire is universally all white actors. <laughs> you know, John Boyega was not cast as General Nux, and Dom Hall Gleason wasn't cast as Finn. Uh, the last James Bond movie to have a black villain or a non-white villain was Yopet Koto in Live and Let Die 43 years and 16 <laughs> Bond films ago. <coughs> Matter of fact, the the um, the uh, the last uh, you may say, well, was it the last Pierce Brosnan one would fought North Koreans? But it was actually a plot point that the North Korean villain had to get plastic surgery to be turned into a posh white Brit before James Bond could kill him. <laughs> you know, in the new the new Daniel Craig movies, you know, Felix Leiter's yeah. black. Mike this is com Black. This, is, this isn't Comic Con. This this one's right. Politicon. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm with you, though. I'm with right, you. And right. So, so money, uh, Felix Leiter's black, Money Penny's black, and now they want, wanted Idris Elba to be James Bond when, in the age of the cinematic universe, why don't they just make him 008 and give him his own franchise? No, it's like, no, James Bond needs to be black now. So basically, they want a movie about black spies, so I don't know what that has to do with James Bond. Um, you know, look at uh, Walking Dead. You have, <laughs> yeah, so what's the, where's the question mark? The question, I mean, the question is, was what, what, what do you think about uh, do you think that having media universally casting white people as villains has led to the anti-white hatred that is very common in... I think it's more of an effect than it is a cause, meaning that Hollywood tends to reflect kind of general leftist tendencies. Uh, and I do think that it's been a long time since... In the aftermath of 9-11, how many movies actually had radical Islamic villains? A very, very limited number of movies. And when, nine, and, when, uh, and when Kiefer Sutherland's series did it, he had to get on air and apologize. So there, there's no question that Hollywood will go out of its way to portray usually white upper-class Brits who listen to classical music as the villains, uh, which is sad because I'm not only white, but I'm also upper-class and I listen to <laughs> classical music. Um, but it's... It, yes, I mean, Hollywood's perception of how race should play on screen it obviously has some connection with how people see race on screen. But Drew's the best person to speak about this since he's been working in town for literally since before the camera was... Yeah, actually, during the tar pit uh, era. Uh, the talkies were... <laughs> the talkies were... Uh, they're not going to work. It's just not going to happen. Uh, you know, things have gotten really bad. I I'll tell you this, that you actually... My agent actually gets calls for a writer who is a a female Latina, you know, or a black female and things like that. They're actually hiring according to race and, and they have uh, put forward the idea that you can't write out of your cultural knowledge, which of course is exactly the talent that a writer has, exactly the talent that actors have. So it has gotten truly insane. And as a result, I think the biggest result is not that people become more leftist, although I do think Hollywood is a good way of uh, selling leftist assumptions. But the, the biggest thing is that it makes the arts obsolete and irrelevant. Because one of the big problems we have, for instance, is in Europe the spread of a, a, of a mean, small, ignorant religion uh, that nobody can speak out against without being accused of bigotry. You can't make a movie about that. So you can't have, a, you can't have art that addresses the major questions of the time. If, if you have to lie 
in order to be a good person, then art will all be lies. And that's why I think superhero movies are all over the place, because the villain is some octopus guy, you know, you don't know what the hell he believes in, except that he's bad. So you can't address reality. And that's why the, the film uh, American Sniper shocked Hollywood. It shocked them by making so much money, because they kept saying to themselves, you know, people don't like stories about the war on terror, because the movies they made about the war on terror, we were the bad guys, you know? And so I, I think that they have basically silenced a, a huge segment of the artistic world, kept them from addressing reality, and I think that's degrading for everybody. Hi, I have a question regarding property rights. So growing up in Irvine and Newport Beach, we have seen a huge growth in uh, the growth in population, and thus far, uh, it takes a long time just to get from one end of Irvine to the other end of Irvine. And how do we address property rights, but also the NIMBYism that pervades Orange County and a lot of suburbs where people never want, people always want housing prices to go down, but they never want the high rise apartment complex to be in their part of town. So I'm just wondering because you don't want to, like, people get mad when they transfer property from, like, an individual homeowner to some evil, you know, real estate developer. So I'm just wondering how would we address that in the future so that way we can have a, you know, Orange County or South, or South Orange County that we can actually live in without having to pay outrageous housing prices. Does anyone want to deal with zoning laws here? <laughs> <laughs> I think you and I would say the same thing, so why don't you... Uh... Well, and then, well, I want to hear what you have to say, so then I'll tell you. Well, I, um, I almost all good. restrictive zoning laws drive prices up. Uh, in New York, you have you basically, one of the great things about New York used to be that it had a midtown that was alive and vital and people could live in it. Nobody can afford to live in it anymore because of uh, rent control and the, and the way they have basically tried to keep, force rents to stay down. You know, I'm a little bit, I get a little bit, on the, on the subject of nimbyism, I get a little bit suspect about this. I don't understand why somebody should be asked to pay five, ten million dollars to live in Bel Air. Uh, and then have a homeless shelter built next to their home. I don't understand why that's supposed to be. Uh, a, a city has to deal with its unfortunates. It has to deal with the people who are not uh, at the top. It certainly does. But it also has to allow a place for people to strive and succeed and rise above. And I don't think that that should be a problem. I don't think people should be condemned as selfish if they want to live off the money that they've made in a, in a nice way. So I think there's ways to zone places, you know, there should be a place for everybody. You can do that through zoning, but all restrictive zoning that tr tries to keep, that tries to uh, force the idea of virtue on the city destroys cities every time. Agree. I told you. <laughs> hey guys, my name's Ted. Um, hey Ted. Hey, uh, Martin Shkreli bought a drug, bought a drug patent and dramatically increased the price. That was very widely, um, noted. What wasn't noted was that that patent was expired. It came from the 1950s. Anybody could have gone into that industry or gone in, in and had a generic drug to compete. No one did. My question is, is how can a free market healthcare system uh, work if the industry is dominated by these captive markets and monopolies? It can't. I mean, that's the problem, right? We have uh, one of the problems that we have in America with healthcare. It, it's funny, everybody blames the market for the problems with healthcare, but really, healthcare in America, even before Obamacare, was so regulated that the majority of healthcare expenditures that a person will uh, ever face are in the last weeks of their life. Most people uh, meet the last weeks of their lives when they're uh, advanced in years, and almost everyone over 65 is on Medicare in some form in this country. So it's like so much of the spending that actually happens is already government controlled, already go government regulated. We've had all these amazing innovations take place at the fringe level, you know, what's left over after the government uh, is finished. And I think it's much like the, the, the last question about property rights. We keep trying to use the government to solve problems that government actually creates. Mm -hmm. And on, this only happens in government. So as an example, if I start a small business and I hire 20 people and I go bankrupt, uh, and then I go back to the investors and say, listen, I want to do exactly the same thing again. Will you give me millions more of your dollars? They're going to say, well, why would we give you money to do what you have already proven does not work? And yet that's what we do with politicians on a routine basis. They come, they break something, and then they come and say, 
this thing is broken, let us fix it. Well, wait a minute, you broke it. And the very idea that you're now pitching in order to fix it is the thing that broke it in the first place. That, it's very difficult to accept that we aren't entitled to all of the things that we want. You're not entitled to live in Orange County and pay the prices that you want to pay. You're not entitled to have a drug at the price that you want to pay. You're not entitled to the fruits of someone else's labor based on your sense of what that labor uh, should be valued at. And that's offensive, uh, especially I think in a culture where we're being told continually by the by culture that we are entitled to things that we didn't earn. Uh, we're being told that the people who did earn those things aren't entitled to them and in fact somehow stole them. Uh, and we're also, I think because of the, the glories of the internet, one of the, one of the n negative consequences is that we're used to getting exactly what we want exactly when we want it all the time. And we think that that should extend out far beyond our own uh, actual merit. But, but in all of these instances, government creates uh, more destruction than, uh, than it's able to, to cure. Have you ever noticed that you buy, if you bought a really big screen TV around 2000, the year 2000, it cost you about $10,000. Buy it now, it costs you about 600. If government had come in in the year 2000 and said, oh my God, poor people can't afford a big screen TV of $10,000, TVs would now cost $15,000. Yeah. It's only because ultimately... And we'd be paying for them with taxes. Exactly, exactly. It's only you because you want to expand the Have you forgotten the housing crisis too? Well, everybody should be able to buy a house. Yeah, and and you know, pr price is the key here. You, you totally hit on it, which is that when you fly Spirit Airlines or one of the airlines, they charge you for water. They charge you for every little thing. Some people complain. I don't complain. I want to see prices as a consumer. And so much of the problem with health insurance and the medical system is you mm. don't see prices. So when you go to your annual physical, you go every single year, you process that payment through health insurance. It's not insurance. You know you're going to go. You buy a product every year. Martin Shkreli was able to raise the price seven zillion percent. His defense of that was that the consumer wasn't actually paying that price. He was saying that he was actually gouging insurance companies and other middlemen along the road. Uh, if you were able to uh, bring prices to the providers of the service and to the consumers, you, you would see, as it happens in every other industry, you would see prices go down. And but a, it's so a, regulated that you can't. And a perfect analogy to that, I was actually yelled at on a pro-Obamacare panel here at Politicon last year, is I said, I want to be able to, I can go to a car dealership and purchase the car that I want for my family. It's going to fit the three girls, it's going to fit the husband, it fits the luggage, the surfboards, all that fun stuff. And I can see the breakdown of the MSRP of what all of that is. And you cannot do that with any insurance company in the United States. And I think that maybe we could even say Obama meant well with, with Obamacare, <laughs> but it, it, it didn't end up helping the consumer because it didn't give the consumer better options and it still didn't break down for the consumer the product that they were actually getting. Yeah. I, I just really quickly want to respond. Opaque prices are due to, the, due to the market, not government. There's no government regulation saying that they can't put all the prices down. Every hospital could put all their prices down on their website. They don't, that's a market-driven problem. You, Michael, you mentioned TVs. The reason why TVs go down is there's a huge market for this. Sucrelli's market was 8,000 people, that's it. Nobody entered the market because there wasn't an incentive to do that. Monopolies that dominate- But that's clearly not right. There was an incentive. Only one guy was smart enough to capitalize on it. But in, for, for LASIK surgery and televisions, there's a huge market, so more companies go in. Mm -hmm. No companies go in because there's only 8,000 people, and you can't get into a price war over 8,000 people, and that's the issue with healthcare. Thank you so much for your time. It's the pot. I see a lot of those t-shirts at my spin class, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm wondering, should I wear, go wearing a facts over feeling shirt to spin class? <laughs> but I think I might You'll be, be expelled. And like never able to go back. He's wearing a friend of the pod shirt, in case everybody didn't know, but... Good day. Good day. So, you guys all live in California, of course. You guys When's the last time somebody wished you a good day? Good day, good day, <laughs> sir. Never. That's it kind of good. awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. Oh, do you do? They like it. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about... They, they say that we need more civility in our public life. Then just do that. Yeah. Just people say good day. That'd be so civilized. <laughs> yeah. So, um, many of you guys talk about national politics, but... You know, all you guys live in California. Many of you here live in California, and in a few weeks we're going to be voting on our governor's race. Mm -hmm. You have John Cox. We have Gavin Newsom. So I just have a, a well, of course, the quick question. Um, <laughs> that in the recent poll, Newsom was at 44 percent. 
John Cox was at 39% with 17% independent, not knowing who. So what is your take on California's politics and is there a chance to maybe in the future, in a long time, uh, purple then hopefully <laughs> purple? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, my, my view of California is that there's the long road and there's the short road. The, the short road is that people figure out that this state has been horribly run for years, and they finally wake up and they decide to elect people who aren't going to allow the homeless to take over Los Angeles, who aren't going to allow the jails to be emptied, who aren't going to allow the taxes to rise to exorbitant rates in order to do all of those things, and who aren't going to allow the education system to become the pit that LAUSD is. That's the short road. The long road... The long road is that all the conservatives leave, the state continues to collapse in on itself like a dying star. Eventually all the people of the left leave, just like they left Detroit. Conservatives move from Texas, where the liberals come to take over, up to Idaho. The, the liberals follow them there. And eventually the conservatives make their way in a, in a circle, all the way back to California. So that in 150 years, the only people here are conservatives and beached whales, basically. <laughs> that's, the, that's, the, that's the long road. I I'm going to go I'm going to go drown myself. This is so depressing. I don't want to. I think that there is a low-hanging fruit in the state of California that the state Republican Party has failed at trying to convince to get to our side. And I think that we are all fans of former governor Pete Wilson, but Ben used to rant about this on the on the radio show a lot. We lost a lot of Hispanic voters in the state of California since he was governor based on decisions that he made, um, specifically about immigration, but I think that the, the, there's what, 16 million Hispanic voters in the state of California? But why I'm not is, I'm not why isn't the Republican Party reaching out to them? Why aren't we reaching out to the low hanging fruit of people that typically share our values when it comes to Christianity and the, the, the focus on a nuclear family? Uh, and I think that there could be safety, security, pro-family is something that should be addressed by the state of California and the Republican Party. And to, to be fair to Governor Wilson, I think that a lot of the measures that were proposed in the 1990s, like not providing benefits to illegal immigrants, I'm not sure that that's something that should be provided for illegal immigrants. I also don't think Agreed. the Hispanic population is voting on pure immigration issues. I think that the press in the state of California has castigated Republicans as brutal racists for two decades based on extraordinarily little evidence, and that conservatives have to fight uphill to do that. But there's... Uh, there, there are several issues that conservatives actually could make hay on, particularly among women. Women in blue states, as across the United States, tend to vote on security primarily. Uh, this is why the security moms in 2004 turned out for George W. Bush. In the state of California, the crime rates have been rising steadily. It's a, it's a less secure way of life in the state of California. And making the crime case, rather than making the education case or the spending case, seems like a very easy strategy for Republicans in this state, and they continuously refuse to do it. It drives me up a wall. Well, that's why Elon Carr actually kind of stood a chance in a very liberal district, because he was a prosecutor that had been putting people behind bars for a really long time. Hi there. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just getting over cold. Uh, so uh, I don't disagree with you guys, but I do have a le common leftist uh, talking point that I keep hearing. Keep hearing. So it's about guns. Um, when uh, we talk about, like, uh, let's say the government becomes tyrannical and uh, we have our guns still, thankfully, um, the, uh, so something I commonly hear on the left is uh, that, well, we're, we're going to, yeah, we have our guns, but we're going up against, like, the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. So. Mm -hmm. Work for the Vietnamese. <laughs> yeah, so. Worked for us in 1776. Yeah. So that would yeah. be something I commonly. I say it to them, but um, I just want to hear what you guys have to say about Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a foolish argument, again, because there are innumerable times in recent history that guerrilla armies have held off much larger, much better armed armies. But beyond that, the whole purpose of weapons ownership is to never use the weapons against the government. Right. The idea here is that the cost in blood and treasure of having to impose tyrannical rules on your own population are too high for you to attempt the risk. That's really what this is about. The folks in Texas want to keep their guns because they don't want the federal government coming to take their guns. That's really the, yeah, the that's argument. Right. The Second Amendment exists to protect the Second Amendment to a certain extent. And there would like, be, be, be a lot of bloodshed in that scenario? Yeah, I mean, the, the amount of, of human sacrifice that would be necessary in order to violate somebody's rights that way is simply too high. And you see this with the federal government on a fairly regular basis, actually. You remember even in very small-scale scenarios, like Clive and Bundy in Nevada, mm -hmm. the federal government surrounded Clive and Bundy's ranch and basically said, if you don't surrender to us, then we're going to blow you away. And a bunch of militia members showed up. You know, I think in, it was a bad idea. They showed up. And the federal government essentially backed down for the moment because nobody actually wants to see blood in the streets in the United States. 
that doesn't mean that the power to use the gun is always used properly, but that threat right. is ever present and it should be ever present. It keeps a, a necessary check on the size and scope of the federal government. Can't help noticing also that all everybody wants to take our guns away, surrounded by guys with guns. I mean, <laughs> I used to I used to live next door to one of the biggest stars in Hollywood all day long, and, and one of the biggest anti-gun crusaders in Hollywood as yep. well. All day long, these guys were going in with the go bags to protect her house and keep her from being, you know, attacked. They called my house and said, by the way, we're watching your house too. And I thought, great, now the biggest anti-gun advocate in Hollywood has enough guns to protect my house. <laughs> That's great. But when she moved away, I wanted a gun of my own just to keep safe, you know. So it's like, I, I think that the, the, it is amazing how elite people lose touch with the fact that the rest of us can't surround ourselves with bodyguards and would just like to be safe. And it's been an interesting pattern too. I'm old enough to remember when it used to be just like uh, people with guns were bad, like and the average citizen has no right to a gun. You'd be crazy. Why do you need an AR-15 to defend you and your family? That's the military and the police's job. And then Iraq and Afghanistan happened and then the military are the bad guys. America is the bad guys. Even military shouldn't have access to certain things. And then we saw with Black Lives Matter and white cops only killing black children in the streets and never anyone else. Well, the cops are bad, they're pigs, now they cannot have guns. The point of the left is to try to whittle away the talking point and start with the average citizen in Texas, for example, that cares about the Second Amendment and wants to uphold the Second Amendment and then work their way all down the line. And there's a lot of people in the country that are afraid of who's going to wield the power and who's going to really have the guns. Yeah, well, that's the big joke to me about the left. The, the, one of the major pieces of hubris on the left is that they just assume that one day they'll grab power and keep it. One of the reasons that you see all the insanity in, in the media and uh, in Hollywood about Donald Trump becoming president is because for eight years during the Obama administration, they would walk around saying to conservatives, this isn't your country anymore, we got it, it's never going back, we're on the right side of history. And then they just lost an election, which has been happening for as long as there's been elections. Some people win, some people lose, and they can't believe it because they had convinced themselves that they would have the ring of power forever. And so it's funny to me that they want only the government to have guns, and it never occurs to them, Donald Trump is the government. <laughs> Yes. You might lose an election, and it might not be you who has all those guns anymore. To, qu to quote Owen Benjamin, Donald Trump is Hitler, and therefore we need to give all our guns to Hitler. That, that's the argument. <laughs> Thank you. Trump said take the guns first, and second of due process later. Keep it real. Yeah, he shouldn't have. <laughs> Th thankfully, he hasn't taken my gun, though. So yeah, yeah. Still, we're still good. Yeah, Trump says a lot of things. All right. Trump says a lot of things. <laughs> Alrighty, so... Um... <laughs> Good day. Good day. Good day. Good day. <laughs> Back to civility. Um, sir, if you have a question, you can come up to the mic. I'm sure this lovely lady will let you ask a question. We're totally okay with hearing your question. But you're just shouting. Ask a question. Oh, man. Good day to you, sir. Good day to you, sir. I said good day. I said good day. So I kind of have two questions, both on, both on gun rights, but they're somewhat unrelated. So the first is that there are, uh, there's evidence out there that the Second Amendment, another reason other than tyranny, was for slave owners to keep their slave population within check. Yeah, it's not true. George Washington slaves had guns. This is a, there's a misunderstanding about slavery in the era of the founding, and we conflate it with slavery in the era of the Civil War. Um, neither of them is good, but there was definitely a, an alteration that happened uh, as a response to the concept all men are created equal, which had not been a concept that existed on this earth until the founders penned it. And one of the negative things that happened as a result is that they, uh, they had to dehumanize and further enslave uh, a certain group of people, sort of as a way of not having to face the hypocrisy of the thing that they, had, that they had loosed. But if you go back to the founding era when the Second Amendment was actually composed, on all of the major plantations, slaves owned weapons. So it's just, a, I, I think that that's a, a, a retroactive talking point that takes about 80 years of human history, reduces it down to sort of one caricature and, uh, and tries to rewrite. The main, the main reason for the Second Amendment was the fact that the federal government had a, was going to have an army. 
And so the, the states were saying, well, if you, if you have the army, how do we keep federalism alive? How do we keep our states powerful? And they said, well, if everybody has a gun, you can form a militia and defend yourself from an overweening federal army. That, that was the whole point of it. Right. Uh, well, my other question is, uh, like Ben Shapiro said in his uh, keynote the other, I mean, earlier today, uh, that Democrats are trying to remove guns that people already have. And I'm just kind of wondering what specific policies from legislators uh, have been proposed to do that. Well, when they talk about banning AR-15s, that yeah. would require the... But that's banning people that haven't, don't have it now. That's not removing... C Connecticut them. proposed confiscation, didn't they? They might have enacted it. Well, I mean, Hillary Clinton specifically suggested repeatedly that Australia's gun ban was, was actually the way to go, which was a confiscation yeah. ban. I mean, one third of all guns in Australia were but turned But have there been any laws proposed to do that? I mean, that's a talking... No, because Democrats don't have that. the balls to actually say what they mean. I mean, this is really, because here's the, and I, I, the reason I say that, the reason I say that is because if Democrats really believe that the key to preventing gun violence is fewer guns in circulation, you of course need to confiscate weaponry in order to make that happen. There are 300 million guns currently in circulation in the United States. Simply banning the prospective sale of future weaponry doesn't actually do the trick. You're going to have to confiscate weapons. So when Democrats mention Canada or they mention Britain or they mention any other major country that has serious gun legislation on the books, Britain didn't just ban gun ownership prospectively. It fined people and, and jailed them for owning guns in their own houses. If you want to be serious, if you want to be really serious about gun control, of course you have to do that. Now, if Democrats want to argue that that's not necessary, I'd like to hear from them why it's not necessary to confiscate weaponry in order for them to achieve their goal. Clap. <laughs> to quote Jeff no, Bush. don't sound Please like Jeb, Jeb now. That's <laughs> really good. No Jeb allowed. Please clap. Hi, I'm we're taking We're taking two more questions, everybody. Two more questions. Or just stand in the back and shout at us. If, <laughs> if we don't get to your question. Uh, I'm Zach. I'm a big fan. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, what do you think the biggest advantage that the left has and the biggest advantage that the right has in these upcoming elections? And do you think that we're winning the culture war? We have Alicia Krauss. <laughs> so, it's an advantage. The, the biggest advantage that the right has is the left. And they, yep. Yep. Because as Hillary Clinton proved, they are garbage at everything. I mean, Hillary Clinton was the worst presidential candidate in American history, and my proof is that Donald Trump is now president. <laughs> right, so, it's, so what, what, what was, I mean, really, if you look over the last six weeks in the polls, it is solely due to Democrats sucking at their own jobs that Republicans have gained in the polls. It's Democrats deciding to be entirely insane about Brett Kavanaugh, followed by Elizabeth Warren deciding to send smoke signals about her DNA. <laughs> Followed by Democrats following Ted Cruz around to restaurants and harassing Ted Cruz. I mean, nobody wants to be near Ted Cruz enough to harass him at restaurants. Why would you? Even... And I love Ted. That's a nice guy. But it's, it's, it's really, it's amazing. As far as the, the Democratic advantage in, the Democrats have a couple of advantages, systemic advantages. Maybe. Advantage number one is that it's an off-year election for a president of the opposite party. That's always a systemic advantage for whoever is out of power. Advantage number two is the president calls people horse face. That's all, they, I mean, they have some material to work with. I mean, the president does have an unfortunate habit of sticking his foot so far down his own throat it comes out his ass again, forming an aerobaros of human anatomy. But with all of that said, it doesn't actually amount to a democratic argument so much as a democratic scream of, of disenchantment and rage. Mm -hmm. That may be enough to actually elevate them enough in the House, but it also off-puts an entire, an entire amount. There's an amount of the Senate particularly. There's a new poll out today. shows the Republican Party, believe it or not, has a higher favorability rating than the Democratic Party, which is unheard of at a time when Republicans have sole control of the government. So do I Thank think you, that the, I think that it's, it's difficult for the Republicans to overcome the map in the House. It's very difficult for the Democrats to overcome the map in the Senate. And so what you're going to see is red districts get redder, blue districts get bluer, and purple districts basically remain at even keel. The, meaning the, the outcome is probably Democrats win the House by a couple seats and Republicans pick up a couple seats in the Senate. You know, in, in defense of horse face, just briefly on this <laughs> advantage. No. It, it, just in defense of it. I'm not saying it's a good thing. Yes, you are. But, you're, but I'm kind of half saying that. It, uh, what happens is when President Trump says these outrageous, awful things, it, it, I know, we love it. We all love it. I know it, you we? do. We love it. We love Stop it. it. We, <laughs> okay, you're not supposed to love it. Okay. When he says these things, he makes the left angry, and then he makes the left mad, and then the left gets real stupid, and they start taking DNA tests, and they start screaming in restaurants, I, but, and he and he, he here's the us. thing. They literally but, okay, start but, demonizing a man here, that never went to a cool party in high school <laughs> that 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 made judicial decisions. What ninety five percent of the time, similar to Merrick Garland, their new martyr. 
And that guy's a okay. gang rapist. But I think that both of you are overestimating the sanity of the left. I don't think it takes Donald Trump to drive the left insane. I think any sentient human being comes close to making the left completely insane. We only I don't, disagree in degree. Right, exactly. Even. I don't think you actually have to call anybody horse face for the left to lose their mind. I think that if you say if a man is a man and a woman is a woman, the left loses its mind. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. This, this is the last question. The last question. What's up, homies? You realize this is the last question? What's up, Diggity? <laughs> Go for it. I'm going to try to clear about that. When are we going to get uh, to the last question? So I'm a student at, at, at Cal State Long Beach, and in my dumb social class, uh, they're trying to... <laughs> but you repeat yourself. <laughs> <laughs> they're uh, trying to... Or they were showing us these stats about how, how income has risen between races and how it's like uh, Asians, whites, and then Hispanics and then blacks down here around like the 30 to 40 range. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a lecture class, so I really don't have a lot of ability to argue with it. But besides like single uh, parenthood, which I'm a product of, what other arguments could I bring forward besides this systematic racist uh, overlord thing? I mean, single motherhood, uh, there's uh, welfare dependency is obviously uh, very high on the list. Uh, there is an element of historic wealth inside families, so there's a historic hangover effect from racism, but that does not mean that current policy is racist, a distinction that actually has to be made. The amount of wealth in families that were not discriminated against in 1960 is on average higher than the amount of wealth in families that were discriminated against in 1960s, but that does not explain the amount of income mobility in the Asian community or in the Hispanic community, where, by the way, the wealth growth is significantly adjusted for single motherhood. The wealth growth in the Hispanic community is about the same as the wealth growth in the white community, according to a Harvard study that came out about six months ago. Uh, and in fact, that same study showed that there is even a disparity, this one's kind of fascinating, there's a disparity in income growth between black women and black men with regard to people who are growing up in similar economic circumstances to white folks. So if you grew up in an upper class home, black males actually underperform in terms of the income trajectory as opposed to black females. So then it has nothing to do with color, obviously, because black females are doing exactly the same thing that white females are doing in those particular circumstances. Again, the New York Times did a massive spread on this particular study. Um, but what that suggests is that individual decision-making and cultural, cultural um, re-establishment has a serious problem uh, for particular groups that buy into it and for individuals who buy into a particular group mindset. The real question is how do we cure individual lives? And the only way you cure individual lives in the United States is to make individual good decisions. Thank you everybody for uh, spending your afternoon with us. We're The Daily Wire, come see us. Give us your measly 10 bucks a month and you can watch us do this uh, all the time. Thank you. <laughs> a big round of applause for all our panelists.